Hey guys, Axel here and welcome to ATEC Reviews. Today's video I'm going to be reviewing a tube deck amp, portable Bluetooth tube deck amp, which is the Muse M5 Ultra. Um, I will tell you guys what comes in the box quickly and then I will move on to show you the settings and how to use the M5 Ultra. And then I will move on to describe the sound in both vacuum tube mode and transistor mode. And then I will finish by doing a comparison. Like I will do the BTR7, the Muse M4 and the Topping G5. And I will let you know even like uh, the IM pairings that I use and so on. So let's start with the box. This is the box of the M5 Ultra. Uh, it comes with this drawer that you kind of pull like that. And then you get a manual, which will come in handy. And you get a leather case, which is this one. I will show it in a second. And you get a USB-C type A cable, type C to type A adapter. And then you get like a short USB-C to type C cable and USB-C to a lightning connector. There you go. So let me get that out of the way. And let's look at the M5 Ultra itself. So yeah, there you go. This is how it looks. I'm trying obviously to avoid the light reflection. It has a glass front, uh, but it's actually quite protective. Like you can see these dots. You can find them on the windshield of many cars actually. It prevents it from um, the glass from degrading from the heat and so on. And the back as well um, is glass. So it's kind of reflective. And unfortunately, the back specifically is a fingerprint magnet. I don't want to touch the back. Uh, the front is not so much. It's, it's kind of fine. And that's where this comes in handy. But let me first show you the buttons. You get a power button on the right side. You get a positive volume adjustment to increase the volume, a negative for lowering the volume. And then you get this multifunctional button, which kind of makes you go through the settings to change different settings every time you press on it. And if you press and hold, it's kind of acts like a play pause button. And then you get these buttons. Uh, this one is for changing the settings for navigating and for going to the previous track and the lower one for going to the next track and also for navigating. Uh, on the bottom, we have a USB-C. The one on the right is for charging only, and the one on the left uh, is like for the OTG input, like for you if you want to use it in wired mode. We have 4.4 balanced uh, headphone output along with a 3.5 single-ended output. And on the left side, we get, we will see the tubes right now. So let me go on and power this thing on. And let me try to show you guys the screen. Uh, yeah, obviously we will get that effect. You cannot see it that much, but there you go. You kind of see here the Bluetooth mode. And if I press one button, I can change it. Um, oh man, to USB mode. I'm not sure. I don't think you guys will be able to see this because of the camera. But anyway, if I press again, I will be able to change the gain settings. I will post a picture that will be much better. Uh, anyway, and we have TM mode, uh, which is for the transistor mode, and we have the VT mode for vacuum tube mode. And yeah, this is how it looks in the case. Yeah, be careful because the microphone in here, when you put it in the case, is going to get covered. So there you go. I think it kind of looks more premium now. Yeah, it's a leather case, stitched leather. It looks and feels nice. I like it. Oh yeah, I have to turn it on because I want to show you guys the the tube mode. That's that's the thing about this. So let me go ahead and start it and change to the tube mode. It's very easy actually. I'll go. And you can change the filters by the way, seven filters. So there you go. This is the tube mode. Obviously you cannot see that because of the light, but let me Turn off the light so you can guys have a better idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think now you can guys... Oh, yeah. And the display is even better. So you can kind of get the USB mode and Bluetooth mode. You kind of get 100 volume steps. And you get low, medium, and high volume gain. And you get the seven filters, like from appodizing and fast roll off linear and so on. You get the battery indicator, the sample rate, and you get the VT mode and you get these tubes. I'm not sure if these are LED lights. You kind of see them from here also as well. So yeah, maybe we should do the review fully in the dark. Anyway, it looks awesome. It looks, it looks fantastic. Honestly, see when I hold it in my hand, it kind of looks like that. So, okay. 
back now to the light and yeah it has ESS 9038 Q2M DAC chip and they mentioned like in the manual that they did a lot of a lot of work to have the Bluetooth in here and not interfere with the tubes because these tubes are pretty sensitive to interference and I know actually they don't have a lot of light so maybe these are LEDs I'm not sure I'm guessing um, and they did a lot of work to prevent microphonics from from being heard and if you knock on it actually it's pretty stable it has like a shock absorption system and I walked with it and I ran with it in my pocket no problems it supports LDAC for the Bluetooth along with other codecs as well and let me just start by describing the sound because this is the most impressive aspect of it. All right, how does it sound, Axel? Okay, I will start by the tube mode because I think this is the main attraction. This is the main feature of this, you know, Bluetooth DAC amp. And then I will tell you guys the transistor mode because it, the transistor mode impressed me as well. So the, the vacuum tube mode um, sounds a bit warm. It sounds like a classic tube sound and it's one of those differences that you cannot hear, like, again, many dongles, many Bluetooth deck amps, they don't have that in-your-face difference unless you compare them side by side. But here, you kind of notice it's it's not just warm, guys, it's musical. And allow me to explain. It has a warm sound. It has a very full sound, very, very full. It has a very lush presentation, specifically to the mid-range. And it still carries a lot of detail. That's what I mean by musical. Like, it's not hyper-detailed, it's not analytical, it's not clinical, but it still carries a lot of smoothness to it. Like, details are not in your face, you know, but they're there immediately. Um, and let me compare it also with the transit. But before I want to do that, also, I want to say the spaciousness. There is an element of spaciousness in the tube mode, along with a pleasing tonality. Um... I don't know if it's the harmonic distortion that's making it pleasing to my ears um, because there are some masking effect going on when I change to the transistor mode. I want to say tube mode a lot. When I change to the transistor mode, it became apparent to my ears. Transistor mode, again, it's not your regular solid state sound. It kind of like sounds... It sounds analog in a way. It sounds smooth as well, still warm, but more detailed than the tube mode. And more sharper incisiveness, like there's the attack is more incisive. You kind of get more details. And I notice it in two ways. The sub bass kind of improves. I noticed in the tube mode, there is a bit of sub bass roll off and the upper mid range and the treble are not as pronounced. Whereas on the transistor mode, the treble kind of becomes alive and I noticed that with cymbal crashes, hi-hats, these things become apparent to my ears easily. And again, I notice um, the vocals kind of become more separated, still re retaining the fullness, still retaining the thickness of the mid-range. The note weight has the proper heaviness. It has all that, you know, good thick amount of, or proper note weight, let's say. But it doesn't have you know, like this, the overly, overly smooth analog type of presentation that the tube mode gives. So you get an advantage with the transistor mode. And the best thing is when you change between them, they remain at the same volume and you can literally hear the differences. So the tube mode gave me a different character of the sound, not as detailed. Things kind of got smoothed out a bit. But again, very pleasing for some reason. And it kind of went like different with the IMs I used. Like, I will give you an example. For example, this is the... I, I, I actually, by the way, tried hybrids. I tried all balanced armature. I, I tried the Studio 4. I tried the Pilgrim. But man, these things, like specifically... Like, let's see what we have here. We have EA500, we have EA1000, and we have the IE600. The IE600 was singing with the M5 Ultra. And if you tried it, you kind of... You know, like you will try to understand what I mean. What I mean by that is in the transistor mode, it's not as harsh, but still very detailed. Whereas on the tube mode, it kind of like, again, it rounds the edges. It kind of removes some of the harshness. I'm being honest, the i 600 is a bit too much in the treble, a bit aggressive to my ears. And it kind of like rounded that and it was very pleasing. I kind of felt I was increasing the volume, enjoying the separation and just enjoying the overall tonality. Um, 
the harshness actually in the transistor mode is less than other like other dongles or in Bluetooth deck amps like the BTR7, whereas on the tube mode, it literally disappeared. Same thing for the EA1000. I don't know what's the synergy between single dynamic and the tube of the M5 Ultra, but it just sounded fantastic. It sounded tubey, gooey, smooth, still retaining lots of detail. I mean, this is way more detail than I will explain in the comparison segment and spacious as well. Uh, another difference I noticed in the transistor mode is that the imaging became better, whereas the soundstage was better in the tube mode. It's, this probably has to do with the treble. And the, the vocals as well, I kind of felt the left-right separation is much better in the transistor mode, and I can hear the vocals left and right much better, whereas in the tube mode, things became, you know, floating together. Yes, there is detail, yes, there is separation, but I didn't feel that left-right separation you know, that I got in the transistor mode. So let me uh, start the comparison segment and probably it will highlight a bit more. I will start with the M4. Obviously, there's a lot of similarities in the design. There is a bit of inspiration here, but here we have the headphone jacks at the, the headphone outputs at the bottom. And I like that. I think many people also will like that. Um, you get here this buttons you can hear. They kind of rattle a bit, some sounding, and you get this you can hear that kind of rattle sound while here, while here, things are much more stable. They actually don't rattle at all. Um, in terms of sound, I think the M5 Ultra, like, you know, <laughs> like is much, much better than the M4. Uh, again, for me, I prefer the BTR7. Let me get the BTR7 again. I prefer the BTR7 to the M4, all right? It's more detailed, it's more flat. The M4 is a bit neutral as well, more neutral than the warm sounding M5 Ultra. But I much prefer the M5 Ultra. Like I, like I don't see an advantage that the M4 has over the M5 Ultra. Like maybe NFC, if you if you kind of need that. I don't see other reason. Maybe the size is smaller. So I will remove it right here. And let me start with the big comparison. And I like really studied them with the BTR7. I did a good comparison because I know you guys will be like on my back and asking what is the exact thing that you noticed. I will let you know the exact thing that I noticed. Okay, the BTR7 is different than the M5 Ultra. The biggest difference that the M5 Ultra has is that it's so much fuller sounding. Yeah, there are other differences I will mention, but the biggest difference is the mid-range is just so much fuller, thicker, proper note weight. Like the BTR7 is not thin sounding, but in comparison, it sounded thinner. And you begin to notice that with instruments, cello, piano, male vocals specifically, like, I would say the M5 Ultra sounded more natural to me, whereas the BTR7 was a bit more neutral, a bit more linear, a bit more flat and uncolored. Um, note weight was a bit lighter on the BTR7. And in terms of detail, the M5 Ultra was much more detailed, again, than the BTR7. A, bit, a big comparison. Yeah, I know. You don't notice this difference until you compare them side by side. And I'm, like, I'm really telling you now, this will be the one I'm using most of the time unless I need other features I will mention right here. Other than that, the separation. The separation of the M5 Ultra is much better. What I mean by separation is the instrumental separation and the vocals, like on the BTR7 in comparison, volume matched after I listened to the M5 Ultra. Again, vocals and instruments kind of sounded when the tracks get busy, they kind of sounded like things are coming from the same place. You cannot really tell so much the electric guitar riffs in the background from the female or male vocals in the forefront. You know, the separation is not there. The, the moment that the drums are playing in the background and you get the cello music and you get vocals playing, you know, and there's bass guitar in the background, things kind of like float a bit, all right? Whereas on the M5 Ultra, that separation was there. That separation was clear. And there was a sense of space that you can perceive when you listen to it. And you kind of get, yeah, I'm enjoying the vocals. And at the same time, I'm enjoying the treble and the cymbal crashes in the background. And I'm enjoying the bass guitar I'm hearing. And I'm enjoying the vocals, which are separated again. So that level is there. And that makes the M5 Ultra a big upgrade, at least in terms of soundstage, detail retrieval, and overall instrument separation. And fullness. The biggest difference was the fullness and note weight of the mid-range. Um... In the tube mode, again, it retained all those differences, uh, but again, it became um, a bit smoother sounding while while remaining more detailed and separated, but it began to be 
a bit warmer sounding like the differences now became huge it became warm um it became like you know like the treble is a bit smoothed over where the btr7 was very sharp and incisive in the attacking comparison so that is the difference uh, between them. Another thing I will just mention quickly is the topping G5. Now, the topping G5, I know it's not an unfair comparison. I think they cost the same. I think the M5 Ultra costs 300, and I'm not sure the price of the G5 right now. But I'm including this, uh, this for a reason, because if someone wanted to ask me or someone is wanting to buy which one of them, I will tell you the G5 is more neutral, way more neutral. It's like a ruler flat line, and there is a reason I use it in comparisons a lot. Um, again, it's very uncolored. It sounds slightly colder in comparison. It it's really doesn't lean on the warm side, doesn't lean in anything. Uh, neutral sound as neutral can get. It's like a wire with gain. Uh, another thing, it's way more powerful than the Muse M3, uh, M5 Ultra. And uh, it's way more detailed. Yes, there is still the G5 is still way more detailed um, here. Like if I would rank them in terms of detail, I would put the M4 right here. I would put the FIO BTR7 right here. I would put the M5 Ultra. And finally, I would put... This is how I would rank them um, in terms uh, of detail. In terms of fullness of the sound, this one, the M5 Ultra, is the fullest sounding. Um, in terms of imaging, again, the G5 will be the winner and followed by the... Um, M5 Ultra. In terms of instrument separation, again, the G5 wins, followed by the M5 Ultra, and then the BTR7, and then finally uh, the Muse M4. Um, last thing I will mention is the power output. I don't know exactly the power output. It's not listed in the manual, but I will tell you I tested the HD uh, 6XX, and it was okay with it. I could definitely max it, max it out on high gain, and it definitely will sound much better on desktop setups. For most other IMs I tested like I tested like almost like 25 IMs and I will tell you like I was using mid gain middle level of gain and like 75 on the volume out of 100 was was like super loud more than I will ever listen in my personal life that was extremely loud so that's a point but I tested the Dyna Quattro and on high gain I could definitely max it out but it was again extremely loud more than I will ever need so that's it guys that's my review of the m5 ultra um the last thing yeah i forgot to mention this i'm all over the place yeah the last thing is i wanted to say that it doesn't make the vtr7 exactly obsolete and although i will be using the m5 ultra now from now on instead of the btr7 most of the time there are still cases where the btr7 will come in handy and, pr and prove useful and I will use it like that. For example, it has car mode, which some of you might use. I don't use it in car mode. Honestly, I use it portable as a portable DAC amp. But the other thing, the advantage is the, the equalizer. It has an equalizer that's available in the FIO app. And that definitely comes in handy. It's a, it's a nice toy to play with and experiment with, you know. It's a nice touch, definitely. Whereas if you use the M M5 Ultra, you have to use like, you know, the EQ in the music app you're using. So still the BTR7 has a few advantages. It's smaller as well. You can see the size difference, you know, it's more pocketable. But yeah, these are the differences for me. That's the review of the Muse M5 Ultra. Definite recommendation from me. Like actually I would, I love it. Like I would give it like four and a half stars out of five. It's, it's a great device. It's an amazing device, full sound, warm sound, lush sound, absolutely wonderful and definitely gets my recommendation. And until then guys, I will catch you in the next one.